we saw this morning uh, Rod doing an ACR, and then there were some questions um, about, you know, if you take the facets down or not, what, what you will do. So let me just give you a little bit of an overview on the, uh, on the ACR procedure. So, so basically, it's as we mentioned this morning, you just basically go from the side, you um, dissect the anterior longitudinal ligament, you cut it, and then you open and fish mouth. And um, what is good is, is a, as Cristiano mentioned, it's a procedure that you can get a lot of lordosis, and it's not a real an osteotomy unless you start manipulating elements on the posterior column. It's actually a lengthening procedure. You know, what you saw today from uh, Dr. Chapman, you know, the classic, you know, osteotomy is you're making the spine short. This one actually you're still getting indirect decompression. And uh, obviously this thing doesn't work if you don't put hyperlordotic implants. We, we call hyperlordotic implants like 20 degrees, uh, 30 degrees cages. So they, this is one of them, it looks like that. You see here, these are 30 degree cages and always, always when you cut the anterior longitudinal ligament, you have to use cages that have these kind of ears. So that way the cage, you don't want a cage like this. That way the cage does not migrate into the peritoneum, yeah? So, and then, you know, it's a very efficient procedure. You guys can see it. This is like an intra view, but see how just by placing the cages, how much lordosis you get. I mean, it's, it's amazing how good it is, you know, and you're avoiding osteotomies and a lot of things, yeah? But then, end up that the ACR is more complex than what you think. And this is when you guys start asking questions because, we, you know, we, we're not stupid when you see this like, a oh, well, I mean, just cutting the ligament and a hyperlordotic cage, what really means? So then we start looking at, and then I remember it was very simple. You went to the meetings or like situation like this, and someone tell me, hey, Juan, we're doing ACRs. I got like 30 degrees, and I did it very easily. And then the other guy, like, I get 10 degrees. I was like, too much side to side. And then we find out that actually, depending how much you release posterior, then you get more lordosis. And, and what we did is actually, we said, well, seems like uh, instead of the ACR competing with the Schwab osteotomies, actually is a complement because you cut the ligament and then if you combine it with whatever posterior osteotomies you do it, then you start having more lordosis. And then what we did is, I, I remember that I was sitting with, with uh, Frank Schwab and, and Virginie Lafage and I said, listen, can we do something, you know? And then they like it a lot and I remember that Frank said like, let me have it, and then like a two, three weeks after, he came like a, what about this, you know? And you see here, this is actually, um, if we go one by one, you see here, we actually uh, mixing Schwab osteotomies with ACR. So if we say grade zero or, or just ACR is cutting the ligament and leave everything intact posteriorly, yeah? So you see here, this is a good example, because in this one is, you know, it has no screws. This is like the A-leaf standalone with a hyperlordotic cage. So actually an A-leaf with a hyperlordotic cage, you do an ACR, you know, but you're cutting, cutting the ligament. It's just an approach that is not through the lateral transverse, but still it's an ACR. So an ACR is actually a generic term. Doesn't mean that has to be only transverse. You can do it open, you can do it. As long as you cut the entire anterior longitudinal ligament and you place a hyperlordotic cage, you're doing an ACR, yeah? And then um, the bad side is, I don't think there is a, I don't know, whatever you, the senior guys in here, Paul and uh, Dr. Heinz or something, there is any code that we can get paid more doing ACR? I don't think it's, I think you have, you know, like osteotomy, you can get a little more. Uh, I don't think on the ACR you make any extra money. And, and to be honest, is you, you work harder, you take more risks, but there is no reward. So that's when we need the organized spine societies to show you know, Washington and everybody else. This, this, this one has to be rewarded because we put more job, more work, more risk. This is a complicated part of the surgery and we basically don't get any incentives, you know? So anyway, that's a politics that we don't want to get in that, but, but it's very interesting because actually it's as efficient as any osteotomies and um, we, I think uh, it deserves its own place in what we do. So you see here, this is a little more a clear representation of this um, diagram 
diagram, so you cut the ligament, hyperlodotic cage, everything intact, so we call it grade zero, yeah? And uh, this is examples, for example, you see, you just, every time you see a screw right here, you see like a screw going through it, and notice that not, not all the times we put the two screws per cage, you know? Because what these cages are not doing, these screws are not stabilizing. What they're doing is just holding the cage. So they don't have nothing to do with the biomechanic stabilization, you know? Obviously, when, when you're happy with the lordosis that you're getting, if you put two screws per implant, it's good because that implant is solid, it's not gonna move anywhere. But if you think you still can do more lordosis, for example, you do the ACR from the front, and then when you go from the back, if you only have one screw and you cut the facets of the parts, you still can give more lordosis, you know, by, by compressing or by doing uh, some maneuvers. So then we go in grade one. Grade one is actually the Schwab type one posterior, which is just the facetectomies and the ACR. When you do that, then you start having more lordosis, you know? And a good example is in here. So this case is ACR, and then there is no facets on the back, so this procedure, you get a little more degrees, you know? We're trying to validate this classification, which has been very hard because we don't do too many ACRs, but we're trying to see exactly what means this. We think the maximum expression that you will see, that is the grade three or four, you can get 25, 30 degrees in a single level of dosis, and the single, you know, the simple one, the grade zero, is maybe 10 degrees, depending also the delta. You know, you start kyphotic, you can give a lot of dosis, but if you start a little bit of dosis, then you don't give too much. So you also, the delta is very important. You see, this is a good presentation of the grade one. So you see just the facets out, and the ligament uh, cut, and then hyperlodotic case, 20, 30 degrees, yeah? This is a good example of that one. So you see here, these ones are higher. This is a patient that has like a kind of almost thoracolumbar um, kyphosis. So in these levels, obviously, because we start very kyphotic in here, when you do the ACR, you get more significance on there. Okay, then we go uh, on grade two, is basically a Schwab to osteotomy. So you take the facets, you take the parts, you take the lamina, you take the yellow ligament. And then you do the ACR. Now we're talking about real lordosis. You see here, the spine, how nice response when you do the full uh, osteotomy on the back. You know, this is kind of how it looks. So no facets, no parts, uh, partial lamina out. So it looks like a chevron type of osteotomy, like a ponte osteotomy, you name it. But you know, we want to be standardized. It's actually a Schwab II osteotomy. And then uh, you see here, these things start working very good, yeah? There's one in here, and you see how, how efficient it is in terms of lordosis. Now we're going in the real things, and this is like the one that uh, Lenke and the big deformity guys like it, you know? Because this one is actually very interesting. You do a Schwab 3, which is a PSO, and then on the top of the PSO, you do an ACR, you know? Uh, as you know, the Lenke, the PSO, extended PSO, usually is a PSO with a T-leaf cage. Yeah, they put it in here. Actually, this one is instead of put a T leaf cage, what about you do take advantage of the disk space, do an ACR on the top, plus the osteotomy, and you take everything on the back. These ones are amazing. You see here, this patient totally kyphotic. Take a look how much lordosis you get in here, you know. This is a major, major uh, uh, reconstructing procedures, but it's amazing because you're getting all of the lordosis from the PSO plus the ACR on the top. So this is a major, major corrective procedures. And you see here, this is kind of the, the, the way that it looks. Obviously, it's not close the osteotomy here. But you take everything posterior, you cut the LL, and then you get the lordosis. And this is a good example, you know. The patient is basically out of the cassette, so you can, you have to put it because they, they're too much kyphotic. You see here, this basically, you are taking everything from the back, everything from the front, PSO, and take a look what, what you got. It's a major, major uh, corrective. And then the last one is obviously the, base, the VCRs, classic corpectomy, in this case you do it from the, from the side, or from the anterior, instead of doing the VCR from the back. And you know the VCRs, you know, they correct a lot, and you see here one of the cases. So you see here, so the, uh, the, um, the ACR actually is a spectrum of of uh, different osteotomies acting posteriorly and you placing um, um, hyperlodotic cages on the front. So the question is how you do it. So I'm gonna show you two videos, one good one, one bad one, okay? This is the good one. This video will demonstrate the... So can we take the, the, the sound out? So this is Dr. Dr. Beckman, one of my ex-fellows, very good surgeon, and he's, because he has a beautiful accent, I put him to, you know, do this thing, so. 
<laughs> so you're looking here. This Moderate is the patient. Moderate calm deformity, you the, as well as a greater uh, than 10 degree pelvic inst. Okay, we're good. Okay, so you're seeing here, this is a classic transoas in this case, using directionally monitoring, finding where the lumbar plexus is, and then once you figure it out that you're in front of the femoral nerve, you put your retractor, as you see here, that's anterior, posterior, cranial, caudal. Um, then uh, you put your shim, your dog, your retractor, make sure that the nerve is not gonna move into the field, make sure that you're there, and then from now on, it's being efficient, you know? Time is golden in here, yeah? Then you start doing the ischectomy as of, uh, Rod showed this morning. So you see posterior, anterior, cranial, caudal. You do a very thorough discectomy. You release contralateral as much as you can. And then you see in here, once I'm happy with the ischectomy, I start finding the anterior longitudinal ligament, yeah? But I need to make sure that I get very thorough, good disc preparation. You see, I'm getting, taking a little bit of this behind the ligament. So that way, the more I leave the ligament alone, the easier it is to, to get it through. You see the dissector on the top? You have the little line in the middle where you slide the, um, the, the knife to cut it. So you see the dissector was at the media wall, of the contralateral pedicle for your question uh, today. So you see here, you put an endoscope, that's to show the ALL dissected in the top of the screen, and you see how the dissector end up not all the way there, and then when we cut, we don't want to cut all the way to the other side, because what we discussed this morning, you know, it's the risk of getting one of the big vessels. So you see here, this is just showing a little bit the this space, and then the ALL dissected. So the next step is, um, as you see in the little insert, this, the, the blade is in that slot, cutting from anterior to posterior. You know, I wish we had, has a lot of lighting here on the video. I don't know why we're losing quality. Maybe in the, that screen is better. Probably looks better under the video, yeah? That in that one. And then you see here, what we want to show in here is, see a retractor, where is it? So we want to cut up to here. That's the contralateral medial wall of the pedicle. You don't want to go more on there. So once you do that, then supposedly this is, is already cut, you know, in this case it was no blood. And then I like to use these instruments, I call the Terminator, but basically it's an ex instrument that expands, expands, and you feel when you pop the ligament, and then you see how, how big it open up, yeah? So you go sequentially opening, little by little, so you don't want this sudden jump until you see that you lose resistance, then you leave it there for a while, make sure that nothing is bleeding, you take it out, then this is, you put in this case, we put in a trial in here, and then um, we are going to implant the hyperlodotic cage. And um, as you see here, make sure there is not more pieces of disc. Then you go with this cage, you see the ears on the cage. Sometimes we cut one of the ears, so that way you don't need to open the retractor too much because don't forget, the more you open the retractor, the more hip flexion pain is gonna have the patient next day. Great for you, but for the patient, yeah? So you have to try to work very limited. And you see here, in this case, we put the two screws because I was happy with the lordosis that I needed. And then you see you take the retractor out. Um, this saw has actually came more close to get, now this morning that's, you know, cadaver, they don't close the psoas itself, and then uh, looks very good, and you see here, this is a central picture, how much lordosis you get, and then obviously the, uh, and which is nice is still you have indirect decompression, and you can have, so this case, for example, is you avoid a big surgery just going through the segments very efficient, and you start with a level that was very um, flat, so it's a good option. Okay, the next, the next one is this one. So that's a nice clean case, but I'm gonna show you this one because you have to understand that this is a procedure that we respect a lot. Same thing, same case scenario. Um, you have a good level, patient is positioned, you mark your incision. This is more like a, we put in different uh, cases together, that way we don't have you know, um, identification of what happening here, but this is, uh, the surgeon was showing a little bit, this is what he's gonna do with the blade, cutting the, the anterior longitudinal ligament. The dissection is, is where you wanna be. As you see here on the right of your screen is anterior, on the left is posterior, this is the disc already done. The dissector is already dissecting and uh, ready to the, for the ligament to be sectioned. And um, so the way that the surgeon was showing how the blade runs, and then you go with the blade into the ligament, and you start cutting it. 
And um, unfortunately, sometimes something like this can happen, yeah? So the question is, what would you do, you know? So you're working this deep, you have this much blood, I mean, you start what you do. So as I told you this morning, this case, the, this one was not even one of the big vessels. When it's a big vessel, this thing fills right away. So you put some, you know, any material you have, you know, gel from flow seal, fibri, larry, you name it. Put some pressure, hold it, make sure that the patient is stable, things are fine, don't rush it, keep it there for 10 minutes. As long as the patient is stable, nothing is happy, anesthesia is happy, you wait, you regate, little by little you take the whatever you do impression and most of the time the the bleed is controlled and and one good thing is if you look um you know general surgeon gu doing uh da vinci procedures when they have vessel injuries what they do they don't open right away and start chasing vessels yeah they park one of the arms on pressure they wait and a lot of times the the bleed is under control you know and if you remember when you have an, like an a leaf or something and there is a, a vessel injury these guys start throwing pictures, you know, like, um, and you can be better than, Jana, you can be better than, than me to explain it, but you guys start throwing pitch, uh, sutures in these veins and you see that actually the hole is getting bigger and at the end is the pressure what stops the bleed. It looks to me like it's that way, but, um, but it's, you know, it's an amazing procedure. As I told you, I showed you that little video to get a little bit humble and recognize that you don't want to do it on every every time because you know you you're playing with the big leagues on the front, but um, we like it because the other side is the PSOs, which is come with a lot of comorbidities. Okay, so um, um, in summary, it's a good procedure, um, great option, and we had to respect it in terms of you know not to have the complications. So uh, questions or something, so we can keep going. Yes, Dr. Himes. Well, I'm curious about the, uh, you looked at the grade twos and the grade threes, whatever the mm -hmm. grade is, but there's a tremendous amount of instability mm -hmm. being created. And so is there a strategy for which direction you um, stabilize first to prevent a, a catastrophic yeah. injury? I mean, do you have a plan for, I always go, if I'm gonna do that, if I'm gonna create an unstable situation mm -hmm. to get the correction, these are steps that are wise to prevent a, a catastrophic injury, because this is basically a dislocated spine. Yeah, you're like, a, you know, decapitating the yeah. patient, yeah. No, the way is, first, obviously, you do a lot of homework, you know, is posteriorly fused. You know, we have a lot of patients that come with posterior lateral fusions, you know, in the 90s, but the disc space is not touched, it didn't have any interbodies. That cases are great for ACRs, because what you do is you start posteriorly, take the fusion out, you know, wherever the posterior fusion is, take all the posterior elements, and then you go lateral, you cut the ligament, you still have the space, and you can give the lordosis. So what I can tell you is, um, Dr. Hines, in my experience, as long, you know, the, 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 the big ones, you know, the, the three and four, they're, they're, they're big major corrective surgeries. Usually what you do is you start with the ACR and you, you do all the posterior work from the back. So you have control when you close in the osteotomies and when open up. Sometimes we see that when we flip the patient from, you know, lateral to prone, sometimes open up more. Um, you know, it's something that you be careful. Unfortunately, we work at the lower levels, you know, that where is not the consequences of the thoracic spine. And, you know, so far I haven't had any, let's say foot drop should be the worst case scenario here. Uh, but, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a significant corrective measure, as you mentioned. You know? Yeah, there's one, one case that we, we had in our area that truly really taught the lesson to me was a case where the, the surgeon did a posterior calm osteotomy first, released everything posteriorly, put no restraint in at all, then flipped the patient to a lateral, and uh, actually had the patient jackknifed a little bit, so the spine's under tension, and then when they started to release the, the um, ACR, the anterior ligament, the spine dislocated almost 50%. Yeah. And the, the, everything went forward, lacerated the, the aorta, lacerated the vena cava, lacerated the bowel. It was under tension, so it just popped that last little second. Whoa. So in my mind, it seems like if we, um, 
if we go anterior first oh, to keep. and we kind of have that big hyperlordotic implant, it's a, somewhat of a stabilizer even with one screw yeah. so that when you do the decompression posteriorly, it's not likely to sublux or dislocate. Yeah. But, the, but the other lesson, if you're going to go posterior first, put a stabilizing rod You have in. to. And you have to and go back again. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, usually it's better to go anterior first, put your cage, and then you release because you, you can't see what's happening, you know. Um, I don't know how, Paul, when, how's your experience with the ACRs? Well, yeah, I would, I would tend to go anterior first. Uh, I'm not sure anyone would, would do a complete posterior release then go anterior. That seems like a, a strange workflow in some ways. Yeah, I sometimes, think sometimes do I first. do, you know, but I don't do that crazy. I do, sometimes what I do is I get first all the percutaneous screws, modulars, and then I do facetectomies where I'm going to do the ACRs. And then I go the second stage, I do the ACRs, put the cages, and then when I flip the patient, you know, capture the, the but it's different than a facetectomy than a full, you know, full laminectomy and the full, because, you know, you still, ha I still have interspinal ligaments, you know, some yellow ligament, things like that. But um, the one that I've done, three and four, you actually first do the ACR, and then you go back and do all the posterior work, and then you, you know, because you're closing osteotomies and that. Mm -hmm. In your experience, can you present how many of you the doses you get based on which block rate you do that? Yeah, we, we're trying to, that's what I mentioned, we're trying to validate it, but I can tell you a little bit based on my experience what, what I do. If I need, if I have a patient that the mismatch is around 20 degrees, a lot of times I can handle it with, um, you know, a -leaf, the A-leaf has been lowering the amount of ACR significantly. As long as with the A-leaf you go and you release the entire ligament, like a from l finer root to l finer root, then you crack it and you feel like this is loose and you put 30 degree cages, you know. That enough, because phi one is so efficient to give you lordosis, one good A-leaf can give you 10, 15 degrees. And then if you have, if I see vacuum phenomena on the top, I don't even do ACRs on that case. It's with 20 degrees of mismatch. 20 degrees of more of mismatch to me is a leaf, like exactly I described, and then trying to do an ACR on the top, ideally in 4-5. So the question is, how do you do ACR in 4-5 when you, re because when you do an ACR, you're gonna retract the plexus for too long, you know? So you have more chances of, have, you know, um, um, you know, femoral nerve deficits, and you open the retractor more. So the way that we do it is actually the paper is published on there by one of my partners. We call it opportunistic ACR at four five, and this is what we do. You know, when you're doing um, a lift with the access surgeons, um, most of the vascular injuries at one level, of course, you know, probably Jana say, you know, it's not a four five one, it's a four five. You know, okay. So what I do is you do, I start, I do the A-lift, put that big hyperlordotic cage. I tell the access surgeon guy, show me for five a little bit. And then he show me a little bit, I cut the ligament as much as I can. Then when I go lateral, I have more half of the ACR done. So I just go there, contralateral here, and then I open up, it works like a dream. So we call it opportunistic ACR. And then if you put a hyperlordotic in four, five, the lordosis is more efficient than three, four, and two, three. And we don't like to do it too much on the top levels because it's it's not physiologic. You know, this is what happened with the PSOs. If you ask Lenky, Shafri, those guys today, where they doing PCO nowadays, they trying to do it in five. You know, they don't do it anymore, the three and four. And you ask him, you know, 15 years ago, they always do three and four. So we're trying to be, that's part of what we're doing is because we're understanding the spine better because the Rusoli, you know, all the Schwab work, we know that we have to be very efficient on four, five, and five, one. So the more lordosis you give on four, five, five, one, the less chances of having problems on the top, you know. And unless I see like a, one of those cases that I show that they start already with some um, kyphosis at the thoracolumbar junction. So you know that that level, the ACR is going to be great because you start already kyphotic, you know. So it's all about knowing what kind of spine are you working with. And the patients love that when you tell them, listen, I work in here like in a custom bike shop. I see you as a individual patient. You know, it's not like everybody to me is T10 to iliac, PSO, see you, you know. So we have trying to, how can we do less surgery, more efficient? And that's also part of the minimal invasive work. It's not like I'm trying to show the open guys that T10 to iliac MIS is better than T10 iliac open. I think T10 to iliac open may be better than MIS, to be honest. But a lot of those cases, 10 T10 to iliac open, 
on the MIS world with ACRs can be L2 to S1. You know, so, and we can do a similar thing. That's what I would say. We cannot get distracted. You know, sometimes I have our fellow MIS deformity guys. Sometimes they come, Juan, man, I'm tired of doing T10 MIS. I'm going to keep doing open T10 to iliac because it takes me two hours and a half, three hours. And, you know, I said, listen, that's the problem. You, you lose your philosophy of MIS. That case is still do it open, you know. What about if some of them can be... L1 to S1, you know, and you don't get to go to T10. What about if you just go and do L3 to S1? So, so that's basically, and that's why we like to match MIS and this, because it's a different philosophy. How can I be more efficient in one segment and get out of there, you know? Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, we're, yes, sir. For, uh, what's your selection criteria for doing ACRs in like osteoporotic okay. or osteopenic patients? Well, Okay, so the process is, I mean, I wish the senior guys uh, or the all the faculty telling here, but my cutoff is minus two T score on the femoral heads. When it's worse than that and it's a def real deformity, I like to see them at least six months in Fortillo, and then they usually come back. They don't expect the T score to become too good, but as long as they are in Fortillo and it's not getting worse, the bone should be, you know, better like that. After that, you know, to be honest, the uh, ACR is not a problem with osteoporosis itself because you're cutting the ligament. So the, uh, technically the case is not under a lot of pressure. The problem is in general, you know, for the stability of the construct, the screws, this and that. I don't know, what is your number? You guys, what is the number for the, uh, what is uh, Cristiano? What about you, Dr. Hines? For the, um, oste what is your cut off for the osteoporosis? Uh, kyphoplasty. Okay. I don't have a cutoff. I, I do a preoperative pre kyphoplasty uh, at the level of the ACR. And so two cc's of cement, oh, that's interesting. it just makes everything strong and then you can distract, there's no subsidence and you can put a, a very hyperlordotic cage and not fear that you're just gonna deform the virtual body. <clears throat> the hard part <coughs> is getting someone to pay for it. And so the insurance doesn't wanna pay for it. But um, I noticed the patients are willing to pay for it. If they understand how important it is to put the cement in, I tell them, look, your insurance won't cover this, but if we do this with your osteoporosis without the cement, we're not likely to get the correction we want. We're likely to have failure. And yeah. I, it's a different world having a little bit of cement in the bone to put a screw to distract against. And, and they're, they will end up, you know, to pay for that to be done. We do it outpatient and in advance of the surgery. It's all set to go. And um, another option. Yeah, very interesting. What are you, Paul? Uh, uh, just a short comment. Like, uh, after six weeks on Fortale, you already have some, some benefits. You're ahead of, you already have some benefits. So if the patient cannot wait for six months, that would be ideal. Uh, uh, I agree with you. At least six weeks. Yeah. What about you, Paul? That is the academic guy, the editor of all the journals. Well, I, th I think a negative. Well, the negative one two rejected all the papers, my friend. So tell me, what is it? Uh, well, you know, negative two point five is. Con yeah, I think everybody knows about. It, but negative two point five is considered osteoporosis, and one point five to two point five is osteopenia. So I, I think people have different cutoff uh, ranges, but generally two point five and above, you should really strongly consider whether you should do a deformity operation or not. Yeah. It, it elevates the risk very high. Yeah. Um, so if, if they're not too badly off, you should just recommend no surgery. Now, if they're miserable and nothing, and they fail, and they're, uh, you know, their quality of life is horrible, I would agree, I, I've used Fortale. I usually do generally two months. Uh, there's some literature behind at least two months. Yeah. It's usually a year treatment, so two months pre-op and then a year. It's uh, subcutaneous dosing. Yeah, and then right. um, I like cement, and I've used fenestrated screws now quite a bit. So I don't, you know, just do it at the time of surgery. Uh, it's a good option. I, I, I do think there's a lo uh, enough data to suggest that cement will increase your pull-out strength and prevent fractures from occurring because that can occur with the strain when it comes to deformity operation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, during the deformity correction, I, I don't try to straight, strain the screws. Um, so you know, you could try to get correction using your screws, or you could do other m maneuvers. Like if if it's a sagittal imbalance, you could just if you have a, 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 a sort of one of the advanced operating room tables, they could extend the patient. If not, you could actually have an old table and put a bolster, you know, underneath the thighs and raise the table and lower it. That'll extend their hips and close, you know, uh, like whatever osteotomy you have. So there, there are various things you can do to sort of mitigate it. But 
honestly, if they're, uh, if they're osteoporotic, you should really think carefully before doing a deformity operation. That's, that's a great point. So, so in general, and you guys also, junior guys in here that want to publish your experience and you want to send papers, don't submit a paper without bone density. They, they're going to go back to you, the reviewers, you know. Um, that is one of the few things that you can control to not to have hardware issues. So it's a really good practice to have an idea what is the bone density of every patient that you're fusing, you know? And obviously it's extremes also, you know? When you have the patient with heart condition, anticoagulated, 300 pound, they're diabetic, you know, osteoporotic, I mean, it's tough one. Sometimes you have the healthy person that is osteoporotic, that, that can handle better, you go with fenestrated screws and uh, maneuvers to mitigate the bone quality.